and initiatives shaping the future of digital currencies and financial inclusion. The DC3 conference program brings together experts in central bank digital currencies, stable coins, crypto, and decentralized finance to share their insights on technology trends, standards development work, and of course, research ongoing in these fields. The ITU will soon be launching a new call for papers for digital currencies focusing on use cases, policy and regulation, financial inclusion aspects, financial architecture design, and applied research around central bank digital currencies, stable coins, cryptocurrencies, and decentralized finance, inviting for contributions on these topics. To begin with, I'd like to invite Mr. Sezo Onoe, Director of the Standardization Bureau of ITU, for his welcome remarks. Onoe-san, you have the floor. Well, thank you. Thank you, Will, for your kind of introduction. Yes, I'm Sezo Onoe, uh, TSB Director of ITU. My colleagues and friends, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the second edition of the, our TC3 conference. As a UN specialized agency for information and communication technologies, ITU uh, has a mandate from governments worldwide to stimulate digital financial inclusion. Digital currency to make tran transactions more secure and cost effective and it has a considerable uh, potential to increase financial inclusion for the unbanked. ITU's international standards can help us tap into his, uh, this opportunity on a global scale. Standards can enable uh, the, the security and interoperability necessary for digital currency to earn our trust and make a meaningful difference to our daily lives. But for the standard to succeed, uh, the development must be driven by everyone that will rely on them. This highlights the value of the inclusive dialogue of this conference. And the inclusion pre standardization studies of our digital currency global initiative. And this initiative is an open platform offered by ITU and Stanford University. It brings everyone together to discuss the new opportunities and risks introduced by digital currency and their significant implications for technology, business, and policy. And this initiative uh, shares uh, experiences with central bank digital currencies, um, as currencies, stable coins, and cryptocurrencies. It studies requirements for interoperability, privacy, and financial inclusion and it develops specifications to be proven in the make market as they make their way into the technical standards developed by ITU. Uh, this annual DC3 conference highlights the progress of this, this work. It also shares insights from both developed and developing countries on lessons learned from innovative applications of digital currency. Around 100 countries are exploring central bank digital currencies with some researching, some testing, and a few already making these currencies available to, to the public. In the Bahamas, the uh, San Dallas uh, has been in circulation for the, yeah, two years. The Bank of Jamaica, Jamaica has also uh, launched a pilot imp implementation of central bank digital currency. Sweden has developed a proof of concept 
e prone and and is exploring its implication implications for technology and policy in china um uh digital digital remember known as e c n y is now available to over a hundred million users enabling billions of yen in transactions uh, india ghana and nigeria have also launched a project on central bank digital currency we have also seen explosive growth in new digital assets built on di distributed ledger technologies and cryptography this comes alongside growth in crypto finance platforms including decentralized finance platforms uh, which we added to the scope of our digital currency global initiative last year uh, these crypto and uh, this uh, these crypto finance platform enables activities such as trading, trading, and the custom custody of crypto assets. In some case, in, in some cases, outside traditional regulations for in, in, investor and consumer protection, market in, in, integrity and transparency the growth of the this crypto finance ecosystem is driving a strong demand for uh, stable coins uh, stable coins are, are now being used as as collateral on decentralized finance and other crypto platforms they are also enabling the the trading and monetizing of crypto, crypto, cryptocurrency policy positions. And some uh, stable coins issues in ambition of a future future where stable coins will be uh, commonly used for everyday transactions, both domestic and cross-border, cross-border. Uh, this highlights the importance of strong frameworks for the quality and the availability of reser reserves and risk management and governance. But alongside key opportunities to improve the financial system, there are uh, in important risks to consider, especially when it comes to how new forms of crypto assets and digital money might impact on the stability of the financial system, a price stab stability and safety and efficiency of payment systems. We can look forward to ex expert insight on this emerging trend over the coming day four days. Our discussions will follow two tracks. One, focusing on central bank digital currencies and the other on stable coins and cryptocurrencies we will also enjoy in deep deep dive session on on the impl implementation at this year's conference we will uh, also uh, learn more about the connectivity connectivity credit marketplace on the GI Giga project. A partnership of ITU and UNICEF to bring meaningful connectivity to unserved communities. Digital currencies, stable coins, and blockchain pay play a key part in this marketplace, which aims to create in incentive or incentive for internet service providers to expand their infrastructure to underserved communities in developing countries and help them access the digital economy. I thank you all very much for join, joining us, and I look forward to our work, continued work together to bring 
a trusted digital currency to everyone around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Onoe san uh, We will now hear from Professor David Mazieres, Director of the Standard uh, of the Stanford Future of Digital Currency Program of Stanford University for his welcome remarks. Please play the video. Hi, I'm David Mazieres. I'm a professor of computer science at Stanford. And I'm also faculty director of the Stanford Future of Digital Currency Initiative. And uh, I'm pleased to give you an update on uh, what FDCI has been up to. So first, what is FDCI? We're an interdisciplinary initiative at Stanford that involves people from the School of Engineering, the Law School, and the Business School. And our goal is to advance the state of digital currencies with respect to financial inclusion, policy and governance, privacy, interoperability, scalability, and security. So what this actually means in practice uh, is that <clears throat> we create forms to engage with stakeholders to identify their hopes and concerns around digital currency. We produce novel research results that solve open problems in digital currency, and uh, we inform the standardization process happening here at the ITU. So at FDCI, we take a three-pronged uh, strategy to research. Uh, basically, the first thing we do is we develop technologies that directly leverage digital currency. And the reason we do this is that it's really the, the best way to ensure that applications we haven't yet thought of will be able to make use of the digital currencies that we establish is to make sure that digital currencies work with as aggressive and ambitious an array of cutting edge technologies as possible today. And in fact, I'll detail some of the ongoing projects uh, in a few slides. So second, what we're doing is we're developing a centralized digital currency ledger prototype, uh, drawing from the experience in developing all these digital currency technologies with the idea being to support as many of them as possible. And what we wanna do is basically demonstrate support for all these aggressive applications, support for interoperability with existing public blockchains. Uh, and most importantly, we wanna show near linear speed ups when parallelized to uh, make sure that these things can scale and actually take on the kind of transaction volume that we would expect for uh, you know digital currency that's for the real economy and not just for blockchain. So this prototype is gonna be a major focus of our work in 2023. Finally, uh, based on the experience from the previous two, our goal is to uh, essentially distill minimum functionality requirements for a digital currency API in order to meet the functionality and scalability goals that we have in mind. So this ideally uh, will be of use uh, to the ITU in their standardization process for digital currencies. Okay, so uh, why do we really care about APIs for digital currency? Well, in fact, I'd argue that the API is the single most important design decision for CBDCs, and it's a lot like an operating system. Basically, the APIs that get standardized for CBDCs will determine everything. will determine what applications are and are not feasible with a digital currency. They'll determine how easily different CBDCs interoperate and how portable systems are that are intended to work with one currency to another currency. They will determine who is allowed to innovate and, uh, and where the gatekeepers are. They'll determine what kinds of fraud can be cryptographically prevented or detected and what we'll still have to rely on kind of old fashioned deterrence to prevent. Um, it will also determine what levels of performance scalability are possible and whether future research can actually leverage CBDCs uh, instead of just public blockchains the way it's happening today. So our goal at FDCI <clears throat> is basically to produce research results that enable these APIs to be as open, egalitarian and scalable as possible. Right, because open APIs vastly increase the pool of possible innovators and increase the speed of innovation. Egalitarian APIs discourage rent seeking uh, and ensure that there can always be competition if uh, someone is not doing a, a good job providing financial services. Um, and note that for both of these things, they're enabled by better security, right? If we improve security, if we re reduce the trusted computing base, if we have to trust fewer people, then we can allow 
more people, more freedom and innovation because we don't have to trust them for the proper functioning of the system. And finally, of course, uh, we want scalable APIs that admit arbitrarily parallel implementations because if these CBDCs are a success, we're going to want to scale them up to high transaction volumes, and we're going to need to do that by just throwing hardware at the problem. We can't then go back and say, oh, wait a sec, we've hit the performance bottleneck. We need to completely re-architect everything. Okay, so I'm going to tell you uh, finally just about three of our uh, research focus areas. Um, the first is in ledger robustness. Um, so uh, one of our first projects is SpeedX, which stands for a scalable, parallel, economically efficient decentralized exchange. Um, and the idea, the idea here is to provide the glue that will allow different CBDCs to interoperate with one another so that it doesn't really matter what currency you're holding. You can basically pay anybody else just the way you can send an email from one domain to another. Only in this case, we also have to make sure that there's a, a currency trade and that it happens at, at kind of a fair price and that it can happen at, you know, high transaction volumes. So the architecture is based on an old idea from 1954, which is this Arrow de Bro model, where you do your trading in batches, which in our case is, is essentially blocks of transactions. And <clears throat> for a given block of transactions, it's a fixed valuation for each asset. So basically all trade uh, between any two assets uh, in the same block happens at the exact same price, which is the ratio of their valuations. So because all trades are, are happening at the same price, that means the trades are commutative. It doesn't matter in what order you execute them. And that's exactly the requirement you need to implement this in a highly parallelizable and scalable way, right? It turns out we don't, we don't even need spin locks in many cases. We just uh, update account balances after trades using, uh, uh, using hardware level atomics. And it's very, very fast. There's some other advantages, um, not just kind of computational efficiency, but economic efficiency. One is that it eliminates internal arbitrage, right? You'll never uh, make money by go trading from A to B to C back to A because uh, all those trades are, are gonna happen at consistent prices. So you'll end up basically exactly where you were minus any, any commissions. Um, also, uh, it eliminates risk-free front running. I can't, in the same block of transactions, buy something that you're about to buy and sell it to you for hire, right? Because all trades are happening at the same price. So if I buy it and then I sell it to you, I'll be selling it uh, at exactly the same price that I bought it. Now, another uh, project that we're working on is Casroach, which is helping distributed ledgers survive distributed denial of service attacks. And uh, the reason you need this is not just that, of course, we want our, our digital currencies to have high availability, but also because many layer two protocols that can be built on top of a digital currency require transactions to be disseminated in a timely way, right? For example, if you're doing things like uh, atomic swaps or using payment channels, generally these kinds of protocols have a form where you disclose that you're about to do something, somebody has a chance to object if you're cheating, and then after some timeout, you can do the thing you said you were going to do. And if an attacker can bring down the system during the window that you have to object to something, then uh, you can get an, an incorrect outcome. So at a very high level, the Castro model assumes that there are honest ISPs that form a connected subnetwork with a bunch of bad ISPs who might be trying to connect them. Um, and it also assumes that ISPs can protect themselves from their own customers, um, which they should, because for example, best current practice would be to do ingress filtering and not allow your own customers to forge IP addresses. Um, but of course, you can't protect yourself from other ISP customers because they might be bombarding your edge routers uh, your, your, your border routers. And then, uh, you know, if you could only, if you, by the time you filter that, it'll be too late. You'll be missing good traffic from your neighboring ISP. So within this model, uh, we assume that ISPs, uh, deploy this secure relay, uh, that we've developed, uh, which has a certain amount of reserved bandwidth, like a fairly small fraction of the bandwidth of the ISP. So, uh, so not too bad, but Importantly, this bandwidth is still there even when the rest of the network is under heavy attack. And so what we've shown is that, uh, of course you could develop this say just for Bitcoin and the secure relays could check the Bitcoin proof of work. And then of course they wouldn't be multicasting too many blocks because it takes a lot of work to produce a valid block in, in Bitcoin. But what we showed is that 
um, if instead of hard coding it to one particular ledger, you use uh, WebAssembly to implement your validation rules and you name your multicast channel by a cryptographic hash of these validation rules, it becomes much more general, right? And so we've shown it works not just for Bitcoin, but also for, for example, proof of stake protocols like Ouroboros, potentially even for firmware or software updates that you wanna push out in a timely manner if there's a, um, if there's a, a vulnerability discovered. Okay, so the second focus uh, that we have is in making markets work better. And so one example of a project that we're doing here is called RIGS, uh, which is an implementation of sealed bid auctions on a public blockchain. Um, and you might say, wait, doesn't that contradict the idea of a public blockchain? Uh, but in fact, uh, this is possible. The tricky thing is users need to bid on an auction they need to be committed to that bid. They can't back out once they've bid. So they, there has to be money backing that bid and that money can't be moved. But if the user disappears and you know refuses to finish the auction, you have to be able to, to finish the auction. So the way this works is users can participate in you know as many auctions as they want concurrently. The auctions might have different end times, but every time you want to bid on an auction, you have to supply a cryptographic commitment um, to uh, your bid on that auction, obviously before the close of the auction. And you have to prove in zero knowledge that the sum of all your open bids is less than the total amount of funds that you've escrowed, right? Which guarantees that if you win all of the auctions you bid on, you'll be able to pay for them. But it doesn't tell people, you know, how much of your money is actually tied up in bids or even which auctions you're bidding a lot on and which you may be bidding a little bit on. So at the end of an auction, correct bidders open these commitments uh, by themselves and say, okay, this is what I bid. You can verify this is what I bid from the commitment that I supplied before the close of the auction. And the tricky part now is you don't want people to be able to, to back out. Um, and so for that, we use a verifiable delay function uh, that basically allows other people to force open the bids of unavailable bidders. There are other um, uh, projects that we're working on. One of them is uh, analysis of the fundamentals of automated market makers. Another is empirical study of uh, crypto exchanges, seeing how program trading interacts with ordinary human users. And finally, uh, the focus that I alluded to earlier is that we are building a scalable CBDC prototype. And what's exciting about this is that it is uh, possibly the most scalable implementation of smart contracts uh, in, in any blockchain. Well, this doesn't have to be a blockchain. It can be for a, a centralized ledger, which is how we envisage it um, uh, initially. And the, the key idea is that it's, we use ordered batches of unordered transactions. And because the transactions are unordered, they can be parallelized. Um, no matter what people, uh, even attackers supply for the transactions, they can be totally parallelized. Um, the only trick is that smart contracts that need mutual exclusion have to implement it themselves. And we supply a few primitives like non-negative uh, integers uh, that make it possible to do this, to implement account balances that can't be overdrawn, semaphores, and so on. And as a bonus, uh, these unordered transactions also improve fairness and reduce minor extractable value. All right, if you want more information, I invite you to visit our website, which is fdc.stanford.edu. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mazieres from Stanford University. Um, we now come to the end of the opening session, and I'm very pleased to see more than 250 participants from around the world actively uh, chatting on the, uh, on the chat of the session. So I'd like to welcome you all. Um, of course, this session is being run in English. The slides will be made available uh, on the website of the event. Um, and I'd like now to take this opportunity to, of course, uh, in closing the opening session, to thank Onoe San and Professor Mazieres for this, uh, their participation and for sharing their insights with us despite their busy schedules. Um, now we will move to the next session, uh, which is the roundtable on design of retail central bank digital currency, the first session in the CBDC track. After that session uh, and uh, that round table uh, on, the, on the design of digital central bank uh, digital currency, the next session will be at 5 p.m. and will be a deep dive session on the digital currency ontology. So I'd like now to uh, give the floor to Mr. Tommaso 
Mancini Grifoli of the uh, International Monetary Fund, the IMF, uh, who will be moderating a next session on the design of retail central bank digital currency. I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? I can. I can see you so well. it's a great pleasure uh, to be here and a great honor to have been invited to this uh, conference uh, that I know has brought together uh, pretty amazing speakers over the years. Uh, I apologize to be joining just now. I, I'm actually traveling on mission and thought I could take the call from a ministry. <laughs> and unfortunately, due to firewall uh, issues, I could not log on. So I raced back to the hotel just in time <laughs> to make this call. So uh, thank you for bearing with me. Um, <clears throat> let me say a few words about CBDC and where we stand with CBDC and then turn it over to our wonderful panelists. Um, we all know that CBDC is now being explored by a multitude of countries around the world, actually more than 100 uh, of the IMF's member countries. Now, exploring CBDC means just that. It doesn't mean that any uh, of these countries has necessarily decided to move forward, but there is uh, a degree of interest, and that degree varies by country. Um, most countries uh, are interested simply to get their hands dirty and, uh, and have not, are not yet close to making a decision on CBDC, but some, of course, as you know, have moved ahead. Um, I am always struck as I uh, travel around the world and speak to central bankers by the, uh, the, the differences in views as to why CBDC might be appropriate. And these range from um, the stability of the payment sy system to market contestability uh, to financial inclusion, um, but increasingly, there are new, um, new uh, uh, suggestions put on the table. And those have to do with adapting the payment system to the digital world. And what do I mean by that? To a world where um, other forms of money might exist uh, in digital form, so written to a ledger uh, that is uh, and, and easily transferable between people, uh, where assets, financial assets, may exist in digital form, uh, such as bonds, equities, uh, commodities, um, and where money can be transferred more easily between countries. And so we might have all become enamored with the idea of walking down the street and paying for coffee with our CBDC because we're all consumers uh, at the end of the day, and we, we all buy something uh, every day, whether it's coffee or tea or, or whatever it is. But that may have been a little bit the tail wagging the dog. Uh, it may be instead that as the economy uh, digitalizes, as financial assets are, are become digital, um, and as platforms are developed to facilitate cross-border payments uh, and other types of payments, it might be that that is what ends up driving uh, CBDC. Um, and, and then it will be the dog wagging the tail once again. Now, <clears throat> my vision for CBDC uh, is, is one that is informed by this, uh, by what I would call a duality principle. Light is both wave and, and particles. Uh, CBDC is both a monetary instrument that you can use to uh, save, uh, and it's infrastructure. It's both. Uh, and I think we have put a lot of weight on CBDC as a monetary instrument to date, but I think it would be interesting to spend more time thinking about CBDC as infrastructure, as infrastructure that would allow for the interoperability of uh, payment networks developed privately, that would allow for the interoperability of uh, financial assets uh, that become digitalized, and importantly, the interoperability of contracts that are written, uh, the so-called smart contracts that are written on financial assets or money. Um, there's a lot of value in making these contracts consistent with one another so that, uh, for instance, a contract that stipulates I will receive money from you tomorrow can be pledged as collateral today. Um, that can only happen if the contracts are consistent and fully credible and some level of standardization of these contracts as well, um, and their interoperability with means of payment is, is probably important. And, and that is a role that CBDC as infrastructure uh, could play. 
infrastructure on which a monetary instrument issued by the central bank could also circulate. So that's the, my kind of my high level view uh, of CBDC. Um, but of course, the design is extremely important. How, um, how uh, uh, is this CBDC going to compete with other forms of money? Uh, who will uh, CBDC reach? What problems will it solve? Um, and again, uh, whether CBDC can be thought of as infrastructure, all of that has to do with design, or at least has implications for design. So I think this panel is extremely important. Um, we've come a long ways from uh, the 2018 when we wrote our first paper on CBDC. At the time, it was still, it was still very speculative. And this is a time to pause, take a step back, and reflect on um, on, on what we have learned. And I think this panel uh, will do a wonderful job at that. So I would invite uh, each speaker then to um, take the floor and, and, and provide some opening remarks for about five to seven minutes. I will let each speaker introduce him or herself uh, very briefly. Um, they will do a better job than I will. And, and then um, and provide his opening remarks. We will then gather and I will moderate a discussion uh, between the speakers um, and, if possible, take some questions from the floor. So um, please uh, let us proceed with the order uh, of uh, speakers, five to seven minutes for your opening remarks. Thanks very much. Would you like me to start? Yes, please. Okay. I'm Mike Alonzo. I, uh, I'm principal architect at the Swiss Center of the BIS Innovation Hub. Uh, for 90 plus years, the BIS has been promoting monitoring financial stability through international cooperation. For the last three years, we've uh, also done it through innovation. We have different centers operating around the globe in the strategic partnership with the New York Fed. But what does the BIS innovation do? We pioneer. We move the production possibilities of central banks with technology. We build PLCs, prototypes, MVPs, and share what we learn. That's all to say, but what does it mean? Currently it means number one, we're at the epicenter of central bank digital currency design and development. Number two, we are experimenting with next generation financial infrastructure. And three, we're integrating with new ways of doing green finance and much, much more. It's about advancing central bank innovation years and even decades forward. Now that sounds incongruous though, central bank innovation, those terms really don't go together. But I, I would suggest and I would bet that central banks might be innovating more than you. Let me give you an overview. Over the years, the CBDC projects that have evolved, we've progressed from testing and concept of tokenization to now cross-border FX trade and settlement with CBDCs and DeFi-based protocols, such as Project Mariana. Two. We're exploring the feasibility of interlinking different domestic CBDC systems for effective cross-border payments as in Project Icebreaker. And finally, in Project Tourbillon, we're experimenting with post-quantum secure cryptography that would make it useful for both wholesale and retail CBDC applications while maintaining end-to-end -end privacy users. And these experiments, what we're doing are, is we're hitting cheaper, better, faster, more secure, safe, and privacy, but why? A lot of our work stems from previous reports and findings. There's a report from September, 2021 titled Central Bank Digital Currencies, User Needs and Adoption. And I believe Masaki who's on this panel is actually a significant contributor to. In that document, it lays out clear requirements for central banks, but also features that end users want they want cheaper, faster, secure, offline usage, something that is safe, and most of all, they want privacy. And if we do that, we're building a public good. And what good is a public good if no one wants to use it? And so that's what we're building. And I'm glad to be here, and thank you very much. Thank you very much for keeping uh, the comments uh, very brief. And I, I should say that I'm a big fan of the BIS Innovation Hub. Uh, as you suggest, the Innovation Hub really does push the frontier 
of uh, what is feasible for central banks and and slowly but surely it is also changing the dna of central banks relative to innovation um which which is a very very important thing um the experts from the bas innovation hub um are are uh, multifaceted as you just uh, described technicians but also uh, ex policy makers and people who are able to to make the bridge between uh, what is needed and what is feasible. Uh, so I think we're all better off uh, with the BIS uh, Innovation Hub around um, and, um, and, and many of the projects that, that have been developed so far. So we'll have some questions about the specificities of some of those projects. Um, can we have the next speaker then please? Five to seven minutes uh, and then uh, we'll come back. Yes, thank you, Tomazo. Uh, I'm Masaki Besha, head of FinTech Center at the Bank of Japan. Uh, it's a great honor uh, to have this opportunity of discussing Reuters CBDC with colleagues with diverse backgrounds. So I'm going to use some slides for my presentation. Can you see my slides? Okay. So first of all, uh, we do not have an immediate plan to issue CBDC at this moment. Introduction of CBDC has to be a judgment by the people. However, we're working on Reuters CBDC to be ready for possible changes in the future. On technologies, we started a proof of concept in April 2021. It's phase one, where we tested the basic functions of CBDC was completed in March last year, and we are now working on its phase two to test some additional functions and alternative data structures. On policy issues, our focus areas include allocation of roles and responsibility within the CBDC ecosystem, implications for financial stability and uh, privacy and energy safety control, and finally, cross-border implications. And in doing so, engagement with stakeholders is essential. Therefore, we organized the Liaison and Coordination Committee and invited various stakeholders. The committee published its interim report in May 2022. Then, why do it's all right? So, then, uh, why do we consider rated CBDC in Japan? First, CBDC could play a role to complement cash. In Japan, cash is still functioning as an effective means of payment. However, aging society and the population drain from rural areas could potentially make access to cash difficult in some regions. If it becomes the case, it is not sure whether we can continue play our role of providing a means of payment which functions as a nominal anchor value solely relying on cash. Secondary, CBDC could support private payment services. In Japan, a number of banks and non-banks are fiercely competing in the retail payment market. And some of them adopt a world garden strategy aiming to enclose their customers. However, under such fragmented market landscape, network externality of payment service is not well functioning. We expect that CBDC, which is highly interoperable with a range of services, could bring further efficiency in the retail payment while ensuring competition. And thirdly, CBDC could transform payment and settlement systems into those fit for the digital economy. This is a point Tomato raised. And in this respect, for example, we are studying on the potentials of programmability which could be brought by smart contracts. By the way, uh, the keyword guiding our CBDC exploration is coexistence. First, we need horizontal coexistence. CBDC will coexist with cash, bank deposit, and other private monies. Compatibility of CBDC with other payment instruments at par and the pins such coexistence. However, bank deposit, one form of such diverse monies, have been playing 
an important role in financial intermediation. CBDC should be carefully designed so as not to impair financial intermediation. And another variant of coexistence is vertical coexistence. Involvement of diverse players is critical for the evolution of the CBDC ecosystem. CBDC itself is expected to be a plain barrier product providing limited basic functions, but available for all. And on top of such plain vanilla product, we would like to give diverse players opportunities to create services which each user can choose. And to conclude my initial remarks, I'd like to say how we see the future. Actually, looking at the current retail payment landscape in Japan, it is unlikely that we will face an immediate problem. However, there are challenges that are unpredictable at this stage may also arise as payments become more digital. In addition, we acknowledge that CBDC is becoming a realistic option in many jurisdictions. Of course, CBDC introduction is not a goal of discussion in itself. The goal is to design payment and settlement systems fit for the digital economy. And in this respect, maintaining the status quo is not an option. And with or without CBDC, we should avoid developing a system that is too unique. Any system that does not fit with global standards will be pressed at a disadvantage. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Masaki. And I think we see very much eye to eye on this idea of uh, um, uh, improving the payment system and making it fit for uh, the digital economy. Um, I also very much like your idea of uh, the status quo is not an option and, and deciding not to do CBDC is just as much of a decision um, than, than doing it. I, I think that that puts things just in the right um, the right way and I think captures very well uh, what central banks are feeling around the world. So thank you very much for that uh, very concise and insightful presentation. Next we'll go to uh, Kwame. Kwame, I'll let you introduce yourself. You have five to seven minutes. Um, and as, as we're getting into the thick of things, uh, this is also an opportunity to invite the audience to post their questions. There's uh, a chat function and there's also the uh, pigeonhole facility that you've been using until now. Uh, I will be notified of the questions and um, uh, uh, ask them to the panelists. So please uh, feel free to uh, join the discussion uh, and post your questions. So um, Kwame, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tomaso. A pleasure to meet you again and uh, colleagues as well. Good to meet you all. Uh, I just wanted to start by introducing myself. I'm Kwame Opon the Director of FinTech and Innovation at Bank of Ghana. And as you may be aware, Bank of Ghana sometime in 2019 decided to explore CBDC and its feasibility within the Ghanaian context. And so we took several steps to implement a pilot, which had two key elements. It had an element of, uh, it was an online pilot and a, an offline part of the pilot. Now, why did we even go into this at all and even considered it? But we looked at our economy and looked at the fact that we had actively, both as a central bank and as a government overall, been driving a digital economy, trying to achieve a digital economy. In addition, we also noticed that consumers had been voting with their feet when it comes to the issue of digital payment adoption. And so at some point, Ghana was considered the fastest growing mobile money market, which suggests that the preference for digital payments was, was strong. We looked at the role of a central bank in the future, where the economy is digital and how do we actively facilitate that? And some of the issues that have been highlighted, I think, to us in your presentation as well, the possibility of the um, more efficient and effective uh, resilient payment system and the emerging risk of unregulated private currencies or virtual assets without giving consumers an alternative as well. And we thought if we could provide, and this was our theory, if we could provide a human-centered and inclusively designed CBDC. It can help us achieve our objective of promoting financial inclusion, sparing competition the payment system, strengthening our policy channel, strengthening financial stability as well, and perhaps reducing the cost of digital payments 
and payment service delivery within the Ghanaian ecosystem. And I think this is something that most uh, audience on the call today may actually relate to as well. So in Ghana, we really approach CBDC in a very simple way in terms of our pilot. What are the four pillars that, are, that is driving how we see CBDC being set up and our CBDC design? One of it is a governance layer. So as a central bank, we recognize that our responsibility um, is around issuing, being the issuer of a currency. And in, in, in our retail CBDC pilot, we did a retail CBDC uh, leveraging the two-tier model. And for a value or token-based CBDC, we thought we can issue CBDC as we do today with traditional uh, materialized uh, currency, notes and coins. And commercial banks remain in charge of distribution Fintechs provide wallets in addition to commercial banks as well, obviously, accounts and wallets. We make sure there's a transparency or we have the transparency to be able to ensure we can address issues of money laundering and some of these concerns, but also have a holistic monitoring system without also violating privacy or getting a bit too far in terms of privacy. So we're trying to strike that balance between having enough information and at the same time also ensuring the privacy of individual uh, consumers and small businesses within the market. So this is what we look at as one pillar. The second element of it was the issue of inclusiveness, which is an important policy objective of ours. And so we wanted to make sure that we can provide. And today, if we if we provide currency in the market, both people in you know urban centers as well as people in rural areas have access to it and they can trust it. Similarly. CBDC should be available to anyone wherever they are to be able to use it and they should be able to trust it. And then of course, the fact that it's legal tender, it's intended to be legal tender. And to that point about accessibility, it should work both online and offline. And offline particularly to be able to support consecutive offline payments so that it can continue to support payments in a rural ecosystem where there may be electricity or may not be electricity, but it should be able to work in the absence of data or telecommunication connectivity. So whether there's no whether there's no 2G, nothing, you can't even make phone calls, this should be able to work. Interoperability was another important aspect to what we did in the sense that you already have an existing ecosystem of digital financial services players, banks, mobile money, and payment service providers and all kinds of fintechs. How do you make sure that CBDC comes into this ecosystem to be an enabler and not to be a disruptor in a negative sense, or at least when you do your evaluation of what your CBDC design should be, ultimately it should have a net positive impact on each stakeholder within the ecosystem. And so that was very important to us. It needs to work with the existing payments infrastructure and add value. The issue of programmable payment was very important to us as well, um, just by virtue of the emerging needs that every now and then we're, we're encountering from a service delivery perspective. And then finally, infrastructure. And this infrastructure issue is very important. So I was happy to hear uh, previous presentations making a point. I think the work BIS is doing is very important and also the work going on in Stanford. And if you look at the fact that you need to make sure that you have the highest security standard being ensured, the capacity to support high value transact high volume transactions, as well as having a high level of availability and of course, instant payment was also very important to us in designing our CBDC. And I should make this point that really when you think about it, we're central banks. We often, and I'm speaking from a central bank's perspective, we're often used to issuing currency as a function of our mandate and the need to get closer to the consumer to understand the user experience, the customer journey and all these things is not what we do on a daily basis. But if you're going to be successful with introducing CBDC, you have to be able to design it for the customer and the end consumer and with the end consumers, individual users, small businesses, everyone within that whole ecosystem. And so the approach we took even in our pilot was to ensure that we had a FinTech involved, actually two FinTechs involved, two banks involved and one mobile money operator, all of them using CBDC with their own apps and their channels, et cetera. And this type of user experience and, and, and approach allows us to, on the back end, understand what are the key policy decisions we need to make 
and policy changes we need to make to enhance and support a potential introduction of CBDC. Also, from the technology standpoint as well, it gives us a sense of what we need to have in place in order to support CBDC from an API perspective, et cetera. And then finally, also even looking at something like offline payments and offline CBDC elements, what are the things that we need to do to be able to really support CBDC? Because I think if it's going to be successful, there's a whole journey that begins with the consumer. We took a very human-centered approach to it. And so we're at a stage where we're looking, we're finalizing our reports internally to review it. And perhaps there will be an announcement as to the next stage of CBDC, uh, Ghana's ECD, and that will be communicated in due course. So this is a bit of our journey experience and hopefully we can add a bit to the body of work and knowledge on CBDC. Thank you very much. Kwame, that was great. Uh, not only was that very comprehensive and very clear, but you also left us with uh, the desire to find out more. You, you said that you were about to publish something. So we'll all be waiting uh, with uh, much anticipation because the work that you've been doing has always stood out. Um, thank you very much for that overview. Um, and, and I completely agree with, with a lot of things you said, including uh, the importance of making this customer centric. Um, and that we were talking earlier about the DNA of, of central banks. Um, it, it's not necessarily in the DNA of central banks to make products that are customer centric. Central banks are very used to uh, dealing with um, with end users, I think from the communication standpoint uh, and putting themselves in the shoes of the end users in terms of how their message is perceived, but they're less used to creating products that can be used uh, by uh, consumers, um, except for cash notes, of course, but you know, there's a lot of experience uh, uh, on cash notes. It's a lot harder to, de to de define and, and design uh, a new product like CBDC. So thanks very much for your insights. Uh, last, our sp last speaker is Willie. I'll let you introduce yourself for five to seven minutes and then we'll circle back. And I, it's great to see questions being posted on the chat. I'm noting these and then we'll return to, uh, to the Q&A afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Thomaso. And it's good to be here today on behalf of R3. We are very, very delighted to be part of this event. Um, firstly, my role, I'm, I, I lead our global advisory for CBDC. Most of my tasks, I've been tasked to deliver uh, all, a lot of our CBDC projects in collaboration with central banks all around the world. And uh, R3, to, to, for the folks who are not familiar with, R3 is one of those, uh, one of the or earlier organizations have started the investigation on the application of the future of digital money since 2015. And this is all because of the possibility because we are being set up as a consortium with representative from both the public and the private sector. And it's really to challenge us as an organization, as an industry on how, what will be the best technology uh, reference architecture that we can deliver for our needs for, uh, for the likes of a CBDC particular use cases. Now, uh, since then, uh, with, with the support of our partners, we have consistently provided uh, the industry with top leadership information. And we're very proud of it. Some of this information has been tagged, has been used in a lot of our publications, such as uh, projects coming out from uh, Project Intanon, uh, led by Bank of Thailand, to Project Ubin from MAS, all the way to our own most recent projects, such as like uh, Project uh, the, the, the Digital Tenge with the National Bank of Kazakhstan and also with the Riks Bank as well, yeah. A major highlight in our journey is really our, our ongoing CBC working group, which is participated by both the public and private sector. And this is really in collaboration with the industry per se. This is really, we designed this forum as a way because there's, a, there's always been a request coming out from the public sector that to create a forum, a neutral forum that allows, that empowers both public and private sector to work together to understand and advance the thinking of the industry around the CBDC. And in fact, we're very delighted to hear, to see that some of the uh, some of the thoughts coming out from what uh, Mr. Tomaso said from from the project from the Bank of Ghana all the way to the BIS have been collectively merged together to form what we call like a reference architecture. Now, the key delivery outcome of our working group so far, which is the DNA, the basis of our reference architecture, there are three things. Firstly, we go back to the basic principle of understanding how cash operates. This is really like the basic principle, the simplicity of cash. Number two, the strict respect to around the current two-tiered intermediation model, which is respecting effectively around the how finance, the finance system works. 
and thirdly, facilitate responsible innovation. This is really a key thing, especially with our part of our uh, consortium members are all from the public sector. Now, with these three, with these three principles, we were able to design a reference architecture together with the industry that's now being heavily used by a lot of our new uh, ongoing uh, projects, uh, both from wholesale and retail. All it all it does is really it helps uh, it helps reduce the cost, especially from our from our central bank partners, and also at the same time as well from the private sector in accelerating the learning and accelerating the journey uh, with the CBDC in a more orderly and more I would say like a tree uh, more around like a rule based focus in the delivery. This allows us with all this architecture allow us to understand around like the 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 responsibility the segregation of the roles between a central bank. We're really focusing a lot on the issue ones layer, the minting layer, and as opposed as well to the into the intermediaries, which are traditionally the banks, into like their distribution use uh, a focus around like from interbank use cases all the way to facilitate as a distribution of the CBDC. And lastly, as well around the, the role around this, the need for interoperability and integration, not just a proprietary integration, but it is an interoperability and integration that really supports industry standards. And last but not the least, also things around like the application of smart contract. Uh, this is something that really quite heavily involves, especially a lot of our projects coming out are from the developing countries which requires, uh, which sees smart contracts or uh, the role of CBDC together with smart contract as a way to create, as what Mr. Tomaso has suggested, is infrastructure and innovation, but deliver value-added services that focus a lot, not just only delivering uh, embedded CBDC into the current payment system, but also allow responsible, enable the ecosystem to allow to develop a uh, responsible, uh, responsible innovation. We have seen standardization around like smart contracts facilitating not just like recurring payment, but modeling CBDC, for example, to act uh, to, to support uh, functions such as like invoice financing, which is something that is really quite needed in some of the projects that were involved. I'll stop for a while and head it back to Mr. Tomaso. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you for emphasizing the importance of interoperability. Uh, which uh, is a very key concept. And uh, these have been uh, very nice introductory remarks, thanks to all the speakers. And thanks to the participants, because as I was listening to the speakers, I also saw a lot of questions coming in. And um, I, I'd like to move to those, uh, as well as ask a couple of additional uh, clarification questions. Um, and and, and uh, we have about 20, five minutes left or so. Uh, so. So we'll be able to have a good discussion uh, all together. Um, Willie, you spoke about interoperability and um, I'd actually like to turn to Mike uh, to see what he thinks about interoperability. Uh, interoperability is one of the issues on which the PIS Innovation Hub has been working. Interoperability, I see from the questions uh, and, and rightly so means two things, interoperability with legacy systems, so you know, current uh, account-based money, um, and interoperability with other CBDCs across countries. Uh, so, uh, Mike, can you say a few words about your vision of interoperability, and if you could touch on both interoperability with legacy systems and across countries? Yeah. So, thank you um, for the question. Um, let me, let me paint a picture for you. So, uh, imagine every country does their own CBDC, you know, regardless uh, of, of policy goals, they, they say, yep, we all want a CBDC. So now we have 190, almost 200 central banks with CBDCs on their own platforms. Uh, I, I think that you can see the problem of the integrations there. Um, it, it would look similar to what we have today, but it would be just newer technology. Um, no, that's probably not the way to do it. The probably the way to do it is to be interoperable between networks. Um, maybe that looks like uh, regional networks that that support regional central banks and their regional CBDCs um, to be able to interoperate. Um, that's what I think it looks like, right? You either have 
um, a global network or a regional one with connected with several central banks. That's the that is the feasibility of a CBDC to be um, to do cross border, and operate to build on top of, and the infrastructure will be obviously managed by central banks. Um, when it comes to connecting with legacy systems, um, that that's also that's a different question. So so I I hesitate on this because you know we we also we all look at central bank digital currencies as a foregone conclusion that everyone's building, but that's but that's not entirely accurate um you know a lot of countries and their central banks for innovation for them means upgrading uh your payment system to do instant and faster payment systems you know when bank of korea launched their faster payment system in the early 2000s you know it wasn't like five years later everyone did the same you still have in 2020 bank of canada planning to do a faster payment system same with um uh, brazil and peru right so this is a journey. It's a process. Um, it'll take several years. And if you go by the, the analogy in comparison with the faster payment system, it'll probably take a few decades. Um, and yeah, integrating with, with legacy systems will be something to think about, but it's also a legal hurdle. Um, is a CBDC, can you, we can issue a CBDC and that be a ledger and be the RTGS, but there will be a legal hurdle to go into that today. But regulations can be changed. Um, you know, it, it's it's all about how we develop forward and doing a lot of experiments and projects to answer all of these questions. So, thanks very much, Mike. Thanks very much. And uh, Willie, you had originally brought up the concept of interoperability. Do you want to add anything uh, to the idea of uh, you know how difficult? Give us a sense. How difficult is it to create interoperable systems? Mike was saying, okay. The, the, the better way to do it is to at least have some sort of regional integration uh, between uh, you know, countries that have uh, trade in common or countries that have a common vision of, of CBDC, of the future of money. How difficult is it, uh, Willie? Give us a sense. Uh, thanks, Thomas. So I, I concur to what Mike has said, have suggested. It is quite a very difficult task because technically it's quite pretty straightforward. What makes it complex is really when you start applying policy standardization. Now, one of the key thing learning out from our project with Project Dunbar, one of the key really uh, discussion is around like, how do we make sure how we harmonize, how we standardize, for example, like controls such as like capital flow controls. We have one central bank uh, over there have a requirement of whatever the CBDC be intercepted that needs to be kept. That's something that needs to be able to be support uh, in a standard way not necessarily mean that whatever it's being used, used outside the jurisdiction of the central bank that it needs to call back to the central bank. So you start to see these are the kind of technical details that needs to be fitted into a standardization. Now, the second level of complexity is around like the integration. This is where we start to see how does a CBDC being issued by a central bank can be, can be, can be posted, can be recognized in the system of, a let's say, or let's let's start with the with a bank with the core banking system of a bank. We have to imagine whether it's an account base or a token base. We uh, the bank will need to be able to recognize it as as it's as it like it's segregated from the bank's uh, balance sheet, predominantly because it is a legal tender. How does the bank will be able to in integrate it as part of their AML that itself is ready uh, a, a standardization around transaction screening, for example or even onboarding of a customer if it is like a custodial kind of a CBDC. Thirdly, around as well, around like, for example, around like the uh, uh, CBDC itself is being is being the the theorized as like an interoperability layer and uh, infrastructure layer to allow all of this, I uh, would say like closed loop payment systems such as like e-money to be able to interoperate together. That that itself could also create another level of complexity. So all in all, it really goes down to really prioritization. What are the, the basic needs, for example, that supports customer protection, settlement finality? Once we describe all of this, this is where we start to focus around the standardization. I agree this will take uh, at least uh, two to five years coming out from the example, like even just a, sim a simple ISO 2022 standard standardization that always that's already taking us like at least five years.
Thanks very much. Um, let, let's move to um, Masaki and to a question that several people have been asking uh, on both uh, platforms, because I, I see that people have been posting questions to Pigeonhole, but also in the chat, in the Zoom chat. Um, and it's, it's a very important question. It's about retail versus wholesale CBDC. Can you give us a sense, Masaki, of First of all, if you can define what that is, if you can give us a sense of how different wholesale CBDC is from central bank reserves that currently exist and are traded uh, using our TGS systems, and how you are thinking about uh, the way forward. Is there, uh, the future lies more with retail or more with wholesale CBDC? The views differ around the world. Um, you have some pretty strong views, uh, but I'd like to hear your own, uh, Masaki, the floor is yours. Yeah, actually, uh, at this moment, we do not have any common definition on the retail CBDC and the wholesale CBDC, and sometimes the distinction between these two kinds of CBDCs are broad. And, uh, but I think, uh, looking at the discussions around the uh, colleagues of uh, many central banks, I think a uh, primary difference between these two kinds of what variants of CBDCs will be motivations they set for their explorations. And in case of rate of CBDC, I think uh, most uh, central banks are thinking about uh, uh, rate of CBDC as an opportunity uh, to bring further efficiency and safety in the retail payment systems. And of course, the challenges the central banks are facing are to face uh, a bit different in each jurisdiction, but typically these kinds of challenges would include, for example, financial inclusion or fragmentation in the retail payment market or uh, disappearance of cash as a nominal anchor for diverse monies and also uh, digitalization of the uh, retail uh, transactions. And uh, for wholesale CBDC, a number of central banks, including the Bank of Japan, have carried out experiments or pilots. Uh, but uh, uh, looking at these uh, uh, projects, I think there are two streams uh, depending on their uh, motivations. And the first category uh, would be uh, a solution uh, to provide payment regs uh, for uh, uh, asset tokenized assets. And they can either be domestic solution or cross-border solutions, but uh, as uh, many uh, private companies or some exchanges are exploring the possibility of uh, building a new uh, securities platform leveraging DLTs and uh, uh, how we could provide our, uh, or as private parties could provide an efficient uh, payment regs for these kind of uh, platforms would be one of the motivation for exploration. And uh, another uh, variant of exploration is, uh, as uh, my colleagues mentioned, uh, the cross-border interbank payments. And uh, some projects, for example, Project Denver or uh, uh, MCBDC Bridge are working on uh, these aspects. And uh, I'm echoing the points raised by Willie and Mike on the uh, cross-border implication of CBDC. And uh, there are three kinds of models for a uh, whole CBDC for cross-border payments. The uh, first mo model is a compatibility model, and the second model is interlinking model, and the third model is a single platform model, just like Project Damper or MCBDC Bridge. And uh, a compatible model, uh, com compatibility model is in essence uh, quite similar to the current regime, with, which involves the intermediaries for the exchanges of currencies and the single platform is in a sense most ambitious model where uh, each central bank issues uh, their uh, digital currency on the single platform which governed uh, correctly by the central banks and uh, their keys uh, could bring opportunities for these kind of solutions but the true issue uh, we should consider would be governance and alignment with the existing access policy, which have been uh, developed uh, to ensure financial and monetary stability for each jurisdiction. I'll stop here, thank you. 
Thanks very much, Masaki. And, and you put uh, the, the elephant in the middle of the room, uh, which is really the question of governance uh, around these uh, cross-border platforms. So one thing is the technology. The other thing is uh, agreeing on the rules that would govern the exchange of CBDC and, and uh, the rules are multiple. They can range from capital flow management measures, the implementation of capital flow management measures uh, to who can join and who should be excluded and under what circumstances uh, from, uh, from a joint platform. So those are extremely tricky, uh, but will need to be tackled at some point. Um, I wanted to move to Kwame and ask basically questions that, that a question that encompass many of the questions that we've been seeing uh, in both in the uh, pigeonhole and in the chat. And that is <clears throat> CBDC versus other. In other words, a country that is already well-developed, uh, that has well-developed payment systems and has implemented a, a, an instant payment system, for instance, uh, very cheap, uh, rapid, uh, transactions settled in central bank money, um, or a country that has perhaps even uh, well-regulated stable coins or e-money, right? Uh, that is very similar to a well-regulated uh, stable coin. In those countries, is there room for CBDC? Uh, what do you think, Kwame? Okay, well, thank you very much. It's a very important question. And I think that even pertains to markets where uh, even imagine markets. I think a classic case is mobile money. For me, I think the primary thing to consider is every country has to situate CBDC within its own context. And that's why you would hear some countries perhaps take a bit of a, a initial effort in exploring CBDC and then may take a wait and see approach. And these are all very much acceptable. On the other hand, if you look at an example like mobile money, which I just mentioned, you look at its development and the role it has played in some emerging markets is not the same in some other markets as well. So it's really contextual when it comes to CBDC because the reality is when you, if, if you're exploring CBDC for financial inclusion reasons, you potentially have an opportunity to leapfrog in a way that a market that is more advanced cannot benefit in that manner, right? And perhaps in that country as well that is more developed, they have some other attributes of CBDC speaks to either the broader population or the segment much better. And so as we explore these technology, uh, you know, clearly technology is, is brought us this opportunity. What does it mean for you is the fundamental thing to be able to answer before even considering CBDC. Now, I still maintain my belief that CBDC is a matter of when and not if, but it's a question of when you get involved in it. So does it fit into the broader ecosystem? I think there's a lot that it can do. If you look at, um, you know, if you look at the fact that it potentially creates an on-ramp and an off-ramp into the cryptocurrency or digital assets world, for instance, that's a very compelling, you know, proposition for some markets where that has become a concern as to how you go about you go about um, accommodating um, digital assets into your broader framework. That's perhaps one opportunity when it comes to a market such as ours with a growing you know, ecosystem of small fintechs who are growing quite rapidly, mobile money, and even banks also competing quite aggressively with their own solutions. That's why we've taken a step back to say, we need to make sure interoperability is in place. Because from what we see, CBDC actually comes in to enable and adds value. For instance, one of the biggest challenges, and I've made this point a few times in, in several forums, one of the biggest challenges that mobile money players have is liquidity management, the cost of it because they're relying on the banking infrastructure. Now, here's a situation where you can potentially have, if you have CBDC, enough penetration of CBDC, rural ecosystems that are also operating on CBDC that can support with that liquidity management and significantly reduce the cost of operations. If you look at a wholesale CBDC activity, for instance, it has a direct implication on even the mobile money architecture itself, which today, we sometimes forget that the real value of mobile money is in the utility of the wallet, everything else you can use it for, not really the legal workaround of creating electronic money against bank deposits and trust accounts. Now imagine those trust accounts were funded by CBDC. That means suddenly the instant payment capability means there is no need for pre-funding when you want to do mobile money interoperability. 
Um, so when you really look at understanding why you're doing this and what it means to you and set, you know, situating it in your context, I think the value will be much clearer. And I think it's very risky for any central bank to not really be clear on why they're doing it. But I also wanted to make this point about interoperability. And I'm happy you brought up the issue of governance. And one of the lessons that we learned quite early on, uh, particularly in the, in the African region, is you know, when you hear interoperability, the first thing you do is not to go for infrastructure. Focus on the governance, the commercial rules. This element is what makes it successful. And I think this is something we should borrow when we look at CBDC as well. The issue of interoperability is something that we first have to start looking at from the broader framework level. How is it going to be put together? How is it going to be governed? What are the commercial rules? These things actually have a much more significant impact on how it works. So that's to the point about even the cross-border CBDC. And then finally, I think even looking at domestic interoperability, right? This is when you figured out, okay, so this is the value CBDC can give in our markets, but how do we make sure it works? We and our pilots were able to experiment with this. So with some of these payment apps, you were able to send money to mobile money, to bank accounts, buy airtime and do the basics. Now, it meant we also had to look a bit more into our operations as a central bank and see how we make the CBDC infrastructure interoperable or integrated into our ongoing operations. In addition to making sure that whether it was mobile money, mobile banking or anything else we're doing, you have the right levels of you know, you have the right API infrastructure to, tear to support it. Now, is it going to be the most um, ideal framework in the beginning? Absolutely not. I think we've all seen how these things evolve. And that's why, again, the work, the kind of work that BIS and institutions like, like that are doing is very important to the broader work effort. It will continue to get improved, but it's important that while we collaborate at the global level to define standards that we adopt, it's also important that one, we understand why we're doing it, so that we know how to ensure it works within our local context. But I, that's, that's something that we learned quite um, well in our pilots. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, your, your first-hand experience with all of this is, of course, precious. Uh, you mentioned that CBDC might reduce the servicing costs um, in rural areas. Is that the main avenue through which CBDC would improve financial inclusion? No, actually, so there's a lot that we think CBDC can do, particularly the offline. I mean, obviously it can help create more access, et cetera, but here, here's the thing that we saw. So one, there's a liquidity operations. Now that liquidity operations cost goes back to the service providers cost overall. Because I think we all know mobile money providers are spending a tremendous amount of their revenue compensating the channel. It's their capital as independent agent networks and the rest but also the cost of providing the liquidity. And then you have the pre-funding cost and the financing cost. Most operators borrow to run their businesses. Suddenly you're taking away the cost of pre-funding to support interoperability. But when you look more broadly at, CB, at, at, at uh, financial inclusion, when we tested our offline CBDC, this is where users in rural communities, even in the absence of telecommunication network, because remember, all these digital payment efforts that exist today, and perhaps to your broader point about the role CBDC can play, mobile banking cannot work where there's no connectivity. Uh, mobile money cannot work where there's no connectivity. But potentially, CBDC offline can actually work in these areas, which is what we tested and we're able to establish. Now, it may not be online, but it's still digital, which means with all the agency banking support and agency banking efforts and all the other you know, rural ecosystem activities, there is the opportunity to get access to that data, of course, with the right consumer consent and the right uh, levels of consumer protection and, and all that, to make sure that information and digitalized information about these rural dwellers' life and economic activity can be translated into products and services. Now we're beginning to intervene in that. So inadvertently, what a central bank might be doing in exploring CBDC a byproduct of that is not just creating access, but also creating the opportunity for financial service providers to go beyond that last mile to create financial services for rural dwellers and perhaps improve their livelihoods as well. And so those are some of the elements and avenues through which CBDC can address financial inclusion more broadly. And I suspect that as we continue to evolve, we'll see a lot more potential opportunities to do that. 
Thank you, Kwame. Thank you very much <laughs> for those insights on, on financial inclusion, a very important topic, because again, uh, you know, a lot of the central banks that I speak to around the world uh, have financial inclusion high up on their agenda and view CBDC not as a silver bullet, but as uh, a means to improve um, financial inclusion. So let me turn now to the question which is receiving the most votes, which I don't really know, frankly, how to interpret. And the question is about <laughs> Uh, CBDC in countries that lack democracy. I think the question is, is interesting nevertheless, because it, it gets at, um, can technology basically take, uh, um, or can technology improve governance uh, of institutions? Um, can, can it take perhaps uh, a, a, a certain degree of uh, discretion out of the hands of uh, officials that might not have the right uh, capabilities and create uh, a safe fur, at least, form of money out of the blue. Uh, I, I don't think so. Uh, I think that uh, CBDC would be designed by uh, the authorities of a country and uh, the way in which CBDC is designed uh, would, of course, reflect the quality of the institutions uh, and their ultimate objective. So uh, perhaps some of the speakers will disagree with me, but I would take this opportunity also to link the question to the, the notion of currency substitution. So what if you do live in a country with relatively poor, um, uh, I don't know, there are things flying around the screen, but, but uh, let me just focus on my question. So what if you do live on a country with relatively poor uh, institutions uh, that are not able to deliver price stability? Uh, currency in which you're willing to store value. Can the existence of CBDC elsewhere in another country induce you to, um, to sell your domestic currency for foreign currency, to hold that foreign currency, to transact in that foreign currency? Can foreign CBDC basically encourage currency substitution or dollarization as some call it? Um, I'd like to pose this question to uh, the panel and see what uh, speakers think. Uh, so both, uh, you know, designing CBDC, uh, if you don't have the right credibility and uh, the existence of a foreign currency CBDC and how that might induce currency substitution, whether that can be controlled actually at the end of the day. So why don't I go first with uh, Masaki and then see if Willie and Mike have anything to add. Okay, uh, to answer for this question, I think the distinction at uh, the muscle raised your, your initial remark on the distinction between the monetary instrument and the infrastructure uh, would be useful, I think. Uh, I mean, uh, in terms of monetary instrument, I think almost by definition, uh, central bank is a sole trusted party which is issues CBDC or which is the uh, obligor or the liability of CBDC. So in that sense, uh, central bank is the trust anchor for the monetary value of CBDC. And this is important. And the, on the other hand, looking at the infrastructure aspects of CBDC, I think most uh, central banks are inclined to uh, adopt some kind of two-tiered or multi-tiered models uh, for the operations of CBDC system or distribution systems. And I think there are many reasons for this approach because uh, as uh, Kwame mentioned, uh, typically uh, central banks lack experiences in uh, customer facing businesses. So uh, central banks could have incentives, leverage experiences of private parties. And in addition, uh, as I mentioned, uh, central banks would like to give opportunities uh, for uh, private businesses uh, to make their own businesses leveraging on CBDC. And for that world, I think engagement or involvement of private parties and the CBDC system would be useful and that will enhance the sustainability of the CBDC ecosystem. And another important point would be privacy aspects of CBDC. And to mitigate 
the concerns of uh, the people on the possible national surveillance leveraging on CBDC, I think some kind of mechanism which uh, keep uh, customer data remote from the central authority, such as the central bank, uh, could be useful. And on the point on uh, currency substitution, uh, actually, Thomas would know uh, much about it than I do, but uh, I think the uh, G7's principles on the uh, retail uh, CBDC would be really important. And uh, uh, it clearly mentions on the principles on the do no harm to the uh, monetary sovereignty of other jurisdictions. So uh, any countries which issue CBDC should respect uh, this principle. And also uh, the important principle, uh, which is uh, set in the g 7 principle would be its principle two on the rule of law and transparency of CBDC. I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, we're we're starting. We're going to run out of time, and um, I actually have two important technical questions that can be answered very briefly, uh, and that I'd like to pose to Willie and Mike. Um, the two questions are the following: Number one, will CBDC necessarily be running on DLT? And uh, if not, why not? Secondly, what is your best example? of programmability of money. Uh, best example in terms of you know, biggest uh, use case and adoption. So Willie, you pick one of the two questions and Mike gets the one that it remains. <laughs> no worries, I'll pick the easy one, the second one, yeah. Definitely from a, from a programmability example perspective from our projects, we have several good examples. And what makes me really exciting about this because it really addressed the problems that being asked by the regulator and also by, by the industry. Things around, for example, the National Bank of Kazakhstan, there is a requirement effectively to support social welfare payment. A social welfare payment that's the, that, that, that protected, that more targeted to run a certain sector of the economy. And that itself is quite powerful because it allows a more efficient uh, monet uh, monetary distribution. Uh, also, at the same time, as well, ability to not to set control, but to promote uh, more responsible spending, for example. That is a classic example. I'm very excited because they're extending that one now to work into like some innovate, more innovation, such as like a launch of a hyper-personalized uh, financial products with CBDC will be able to create more like features that's more, that's more catered for the, for example, the underbank. That's like one of the good examples. Thank you so much, Willie. And uh, that is a form, to be clear, that is a form of fiscal policy, not monetary policy. This is a, a redistribution. Um, it, it's, a, a, it's a basically a, um, you call those uh, in, in the US food stamps, for instance. So you get a little coupon for which, with which you can buy food, but not uh, alcohol or, or other things, for instance. And uh, I suppose CBDC can be used for that, there is an interesting question as to uh, whether CBDC would be very popular if it was used, used especially for that among people who uh, want to have more discretion over their spending. But it's absolutely right that, that in terms of uh, targeted fiscal programs, uh, CBDC could certainly uh, improve the efficiency of, uh, of disbursement. So thanks very much, Willie, for that example. Mike, you have uh, the last word and the question is, uh, will CBDC be implemented on DLT necessarily? If not, why not? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it depends on the use case. For retail, I think it's it's much more difficult to argue the case for uh, for DLT just because the scalability uses on DLT and privacy on on DLT is actually very difficult to do with scale. However, on the wholesale side, I think there's more a clear answer. And the reason why DLT is actually pretty interesting is because of the composability aspect of central bank money. Um, that would be gosh, kind of cool. And so composability is this idea that you can compose uh, the, you know, the idea of Lego money, that you can build things on top of uh, on top of money. And a good example of that is stable coins. And it's about 130, 140 billion in circulation now. And you use composability to put stable coins into different DeFi protocols, different protocols in general, building an entire ecosystem of financial products 
that without this composability element, um, it's actually just a chaotic mess of, of protocols that wouldn't actually make sense. Um, so the thing about DLTs that is pretty cool is the composability and the fact that you can use the same uh, base components to build on top of. So I think DLTs are, are important for that reason. Um, and you really can't get the same in a, in a database, for example. Great, Mike, thank you very much. I think that um, is a great note to end on for several reasons. One, uh, you circle back actually to what I was saying originally, CBDC as, as infrastructure also means CBDC as a basis on which to program and to write contracts that are consistent with one another. Um, and I think you, you identified that uh, very eloquently. And the other is your very nice metaphor of composability. Uh, it's always nice to end on a musical note and the idea that we can compose with uh, CBDC is, is a lovely one. So thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you for participating. Thank you to our wonderful speakers for their insightful and very clear remarks. And thanks to the audience uh, for all the questions that were posed. Sorry, we weren't able to get to all of the questions. There were many. Uh, but hopefully this is just the beginning of the conversation and you can stay in touch with the panelists uh, by writing to them directly. So I should just say lastly that the Digital Currency Global Initiative uh, that has organized this wonderful conference is a partnership between ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, and the Future of Digital Money Initiative at Stanford University, which happens to be my alma mater. So I'm, I'm very proud of Stanford to be supporting uh, this conference. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, onwards to the next session. Thank you.